Hello and welcome to FinTech Impact. I'm your host, Jason Pereira. Today on the show is yet another something different type of episode. I was recently asked to take part in the Investment Planning Council annual conferences panel on FinTech. With me was Adam Valeski of Portage Ventures, Dave Nugent of Well Simple, Daniel Everhart of Coho, and Zach Brown of Dialogue. And with that, here's the panel. Chris and Reggie, thank you so much for having me. I actually was supposed to be here last year, but this guy named Paul Demery III took my spot on the agenda. So fortunately, he wasn't available this year. So I get to be here with you. Really look forward to this panel. Great people, many of which I get to work with on a very frequent basis. So what we'd like to do to kick things off is for you each to provide an introduction of yourselves, what you do, what your business is, and maybe five minutes each. And then we'll kind of bring it back to questions that will take us away for the rest of the session. <laughs> and should note, please start writing down questions because there'll be about 15 minutes towards the end that we'll go to the crowd uh, to ask our panelists. So, yeah. Jason? Thank you. So Jason Pereira, many of you know. <laughs> That's good, because I was half expecting booze. So many of you know I'm an IPC advisor, been here for a long time. But what many of you don't know is that I've always been a technophile by heart. And when the FinTech scene started to pick up in Toronto, I started just bugging guys like the guy to my left over here. But by the way, easy way to get a FinTech founder on email, first name at URL.com, <laughs> universal. So bugging them and saying, hey, instead of not working against me, have you thought about working with me? And that started a conversation and a bunch of friendships and networks. And since then, I've launched a FinTech podcast where all of you can learn about this sort of stuff called FinTech Impact, where I introduce, well, I interview people such as the esteemed colleagues on the, um, on the panel here. And I've also gone on to consult and advise several technology companies now. And I just found out we were at Mac at the same time. All right. Yeah. You didn't talk about all your credentials. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that will be a concluding uh, statement. statement. I, don't know who in, I don't know who in marketing actually put them all down on the list of attendee on the panel speakers, but that was not fun. That was fun <laughs> nice. <laughs> hey, everyone. My name is Dave Nugent. I was part of the founding team of Wealth Simple. <laughs> I'm actually a former advisor myself from RBC Dominion Securities. Don't hold that against me. Well, Simple, when it was founded, was really focused on kind of direct to consumers, mostly actually focused along millennials, kind of the underserved of the advice market. About three years ago, we started working with advisors to basically power their businesses. The speakers today have been kind of really, really great at hitting home on a lot of the things that Well Simple believes in around the transparency, the honesty of the value that you provide to clients. Our kind of, if you think about what Wellsimple really does, is we provide basically an infrastructure to do client onboarding, ID verification, compliance, tax reporting, all the fun things that none of you actually care about until they go wrong and clients complain. That's where we think of ourselves as kind of providing that infrastructure. We actually purchased our own back office uh, about four years ago, just after Adam and Portage put capital into us because we recognize the, the problems around legacy systems. And over the last four years, the team has actually become our largest team at Wellsimple, but they're all software developers. Because a lot of the processes that exist within a back office are somewhat black and white. Technology is really, really good right now at, at basically replacing black and white process. The gray part, we talk about AI and all that. We've also talked a lot about uh, the, the value of human advice. So I don't think people need to be too scared about AI taking over uh, your client base. I think the media kind of blew that out of proportion early on. Now you're seeing the stock photography of the robot with the human hand connecting. I think you're going to see more of that going forward. We're certainly seeing it already in the US, and we're really excited to be working with all of you. Awesome. Thank you. My name is Daniel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Coho. And, and so what Coho is, is what's called the Challenger Bank. So I started Coho about five years ago, predicated on the fact that I think Canadian banks have done a pretty a good job at managing systemic risk and a pretty poor job at, at the rest of it. And so our real vision was how do we give everybody a great financial foundation and sort of maximize upward mobility. And so the way that we do that today is we're a Visa card and a Coho app. You can think of this as doing everything your bank account traditionally does. We don't charge fees. And then we wrap kind of a great product experience around that such that we make it much easier for users to kind of save and understand their finances. The way that it works is we partnered with a financial institution so that they hold the money and then we kind of get to do everything else. So we leveraged what we like about the Canadian system, which is that money is held well and, and securely. And so that's us. We are in the process of standing up a B2B arm as well uh, in a white label capacity, which I'm sure we'll touch on today. We are, yeah, well, we've been live for about two and a half years, raised about $50 million and, and have about 130,000 Canadians on the platform. 
Okay. Great. I'm Zach Brown from Dialog. So if you're not familiar with Dialog, what we do is we offer a virtual clinic to Canadians in their pocket. If this does sound a little bit familiar, it's because uh, you all, as part of the uh, IPC family, have access to this benefit uh, through your Great West Life group insurance plan. If you're interested in uh, understanding a little bit more about how to sign up for that, uh, you can come and see me after. I'll be hanging around for a few minutes. But effectively, what we're trying to do at Dialog is uh, allow Canadians to be proactive about their, their physical health, uh, about their mental health. And to date, we've been working with about 500 organizations across Canada. Uh, as far as our distribution strategy is concerned, we've been primarily distributed up to this point through employers. So we offer this service to the employer who in turn provides it to their employees and the benefits of their employees as a dependent. So we're fortunate to have been working with employers of all sizes, ranging from the mom and pop uh, shop who joined us in our, in our first couple of months of starting the business to more recently uh, having onboarded groups like Sobeys with 20,000 employees coast to coast, the National Bank, IGM Financial, Canada Life, and their 11,000 employees coast to coast. So I'm very, very grateful to be part of this panel here today. As far as the reason why I'm here, while we've been working primarily with employers to date, we see a really uh, unique and interesting opportunity to work with you all, uh, the advisors, to uh, differentiate yourselves, to stand out. And I know that, that Adam will be kind of talking a little bit about that uh, throughout the panel today. So thanks for having me. Super. So I'm actually listening to Reggie. I'm going to change a little bit of my focus, my first question to you, Jason. I think we all, and certainly from our background as a fintech investor, there's a certain degree of table stakes. And I, I think what IPC has rolled out are, are kind of the basic table stakes. When we look at platforms to invest in, it's ensuring that they've got that core technology, but really how are they going to attract the customer? And it's those that are really worthy of investing is, is how do they leverage their technology to be a delightful experience to their customer and uh, proactively attract top of funnel opportunities as, as we talk about. Maybe talk about in your own practice, not how technology is helping you from the back end perspective, but talk about like how are you using technology, maybe a couple specific use cases of a part of your reach out to increase your top of funnel strategy from a marketing perspective. Yeah, I'd say that from a marketing perspective, there's a bunch of different venues we talk about and then also how to service them. I think we, just before I get to that, I think a lot of times people get just intimidated, not only by the complexity of this stuff or how many options there are, but also like when we start talking to the likes of the people to my left, they're doing some really impressive and lots of big things, but there's so many small incremental, tiny things we can do in our own practices early on by adopting small technological solutions that all cumulatively have a big impact, right? So top of funnel strategies, I recently adopted a platform called Advisor Stream for social media. And again, social media is something we're all supposed to be out on there, sharing stuff with, with, with consumers and clients and prospects. And it takes a lot of time. And you know, if I'm going to go hunting around for articles that might or might not be of interest, it's going to eat up a lot into my time. So this platform specifically aggregates content from all the big publishers, essentially, Forbes, Barron's, Globe and Mail, whatever it might be, and then actually curates it for me so I can push it out to my, to my consumers, to my followers, and then simultaneously tracks that engagement and helps me create a capture their information for further marketing in my newsletter. So that is helping fill the top of funnel. And then when they get, when I actually start engaging with them, the onboarding process that comes from IPC is one thing, but there's all kinds of aspects of our business that we can't sit back and wait for the dealership to get to because all our practices are a little bit unique. Some of us do very comprehensive financial planning, some of us do not. So, or maybe have a larger focus on insurance. And there's all kinds of tools that are out there that IPC is not really looking at it right now because that's not their focus, but we can enhance that aspect of our business. So a couple simple examples. My associate at one point who books all our meetings was telling me that 60% of her time was spent booking and confirming and rebooking meetings. And I heard that number and I put an end to it right away. Solution that cost less than, cost less than $3,000 for three advisors for the year ended up basically reducing her booking and, and rebooking time down to less than 10% of her time, right? So we're talking, imagine her salary, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars in efficiency. And all it is is an online booking system that is very easy to set up and count, clients can pick their own times and it confirms all their times. Data collection is a major pain in the butt for all of us when we want to do financial planning. There's online questionnaire tools we can do to create secure environments for pulling this all down. And the clients are taking these opportunities because they basically, oh, this is great. I get to just see what works for me as opposed to going back and forth over email. I can put all this into something I can trust. I can start having these conversations online as opposed to traditionally. And I'll tell you one of the biggest surprises was when we started offering 
an option of having client meetings in, over, over Zoom as opposed to in person, I figured there would be a definite demographic tilt to that. I was wrong. The number of senior citizens and people in their 70s who are taking us up on virtual meetings is astonishing. And the message is always the same. Why am I going to drive in Toronto traffic if I don't have to? So, so it's super interesting. So I think, I think that's a misnomer, I think, across the industry of the segmentation of a technocrat is exactly. someone who's 25 and under. <laughs> Maybe I'm actually going to jump Daniel. What's the oldest customer? I mean, you're basically an online bank. Everything's virtual, everything's chat. What's your oldest demographic of user? Yeah, I mean, our oldest user on the platform is 82. I think that <laughs> might be like a doting grandfather. But we do have like 60s and 70-year-olds showing up on the platform uh, consistently. I find that fascinating. Yeah. And I uh, think, yeah, go ahead. Maybe just one more. Like when we launched, our, we were kind of expecting to be an early millennial just out of university product. And today, the average age of a user on our platform is 33 years old. So um, we, we are surprised and delighted by that. Okay, maybe I know well simple. I'm fortunate to sit in the board meetings and see also those demographics yeah. continue to yeah. to age. I think our oldest client is about 104, <laughs> <laughs> and they signed up fully online themselves. Yeah, I think one of the interesting trends for us has been the introduction to well simple through the kids. So the kids are saying to mom and dad hey, what are you doing? You should try it well, simple. And so gone, I think, are the days where uh, you have people saying, well, I'm with my parents' broker. You are seeing the opposite start to happen. Millennials tend to be very well researched and they do a lot of homework before making a decision. Parents are basically kind of depending on their kids now to start to do a lot of that work ahead of time. On our advisor side of the business, the average age of client is 60 years old probably more or less what your books look like. On the consumer side, it's about 33, similar to Daniel. And so what you're seeing is this concept of provide whatever service package you want on top of the WellSimple infrastructure and run your business how you want to. So just because someone is young or old, it doesn't really matter when it comes to platforms. You definitely need an email address and you need an internet connection because we have had cases where people say, can you help my client who's 90 who doesn't own a computer? And we say, unfortunately, you need to know the basics. You can get an iPad with the app and just cut the app, but you need to at least have that connection. One of the themes that uh, we have at Portage right now is that there was a lot of unique individual fintech companies emerging three, four years ago, many of which don't survive. But those that are starting to mature, there's this whole concept of rebundling. And I think you're going to start seeing more fintechs work together, and we'll describe some of those examples in a minute. The other theme that's important to us is this emergent of, emergence of not just talking about people's financial well-being, but just talking generically about well-being. So Zach, maybe you can walk us through a little bit about the dialogue platform, how that can be part of a broader sort of engagement platform with someone's customers, and really touching on the well-being, not just the financial well-being. Yeah, absolutely. So when we launched the company a few years ago, we were focused very heavily on physical health. So we were uh, effectively what our service allows people to do is connect with a healthcare practitioner in minutes from wherever they are, whether it be through their mobile device or through their desktop or, or through their tablet. But we do require an internet connection. Um, no longer an email address, but definitely an internet connection. And what we've seen over the last couple of years is that evolved quite a lot from being primarily focused on physical health, but really shifted a lot towards mental health, wellness, and well-being. So we're beyond offering this virtual clinic, we begin offering services to complement that, focused on stress management, focused on other aspects of, that comprise this notion of wellness. And a big part of that is, as you know, financial well-being. So many of the employers that we work with are saying, you know, I have a, this platform that helps with legal issues, I have this platform that helps with financial issues. And one of the really interesting kind of use cases for us more recently is trying to act as a glue to bring these things together. So one of our, kind of value props and one of the things that we've done really well working with employers is actually promote the service, make sure that, that the employees of the companies that we work with know about Dialog and as a result, we're able to go back to the HR folks and the executives within those companies and say, not only can we prop up the health within your company by promoting Dialog, but we can help to actually bring, shed light and bring exposure to some of the other services that you're already investing in. So I think that there's an interesting parallel with advisors as well. You know, Traditionally, our business has been based on working with employers, but you know, conversing with, with Reggie uh, leading up to today, I think there's a really interesting use case for sort of that loyalty and retention play amongst some of your clients. So that's not to say that, that a client is only gonna stick with you forever because you offer dialogue, but it's just one more way to implicitly and both and explicitly demonstrate that you're invested not just in their financial wellness, but in their mental wellness 
as well as their physical wellness, and all three things just go obviously very closely together. It's interesting. I think it's these small adjacencies that can be so powerful for stickiness of clients. One of our advisors is, is a gentleman named Greg Fleming, who formerly was the head of wealth for Morgan Stanley and now is the CEO of a new platform called Rockefeller Asset Management or Wealth in the U.S. And he was saying that one of their top features requested by their ultra high net worth families is bill pay. And they literally have a whole desk of people that pay bills for their clients. I was like, oh, I've got a technology for you. <laughs> Daniel, banking is just a, such a simple way to increase engagement with your customer. It's something we have to do every single day. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what is your engagement on Coho? What can you do with Coho? And then maybe spend a couple minutes talking about where Coho is going with some of your partners. Sure. Yeah, so, so our core thesis has always been, if we can live top of funnel, that that is the best place to really understand both our clients' lives and how to create value for them. So today, Coho users are opening the app 34 times a month. They're making purchases around 20 times a month. So you call that kind of 50 to 55 brand touches a month. So we're really happy with that. And what you typically see is now Coho users are joining the platform and they're projected to use a product for four, five, six years with 55 brand touches a month. So that, that's a really powerful relationship at which to build a foundation. Then our perspective is how do we drive as much value for the user as we can and, and really kind of hold that position of trust responsibly. And so we're doing a couple things on the product itself. As I mentioned, it does everything a bank does, but the first kind of sort order with Coho is that we give you a spendable balance. So historically, a bank tells you how much money you have, whereas we tell you how much money you actually have to spend, which is actually a really important distinction for the vast majority of Canadians. And then through that, we automate how people save and kind of reward and incentivize and, and kind of create delightful savings experiences. So where that goes from here is we're actually working on a product or um, integration with Wellsimple where all Coho products will also carry a 2% balance. And so our perspective is, how do you maximize the utility of a dollar? And that's getting rid of the traditional <coughs> constructs between a checkings account and a savings account. And so we do have that launching, which will kind of maximize and simplify financial lives. The end state, just to kind of give you guys a peek of where we're going, is we believe that if you are comfortable with the risk portfolio, you should actually just have a card linked directly to your investment vehicles and your investment account. And when you buy a coffee at Starbucks, it should execute an equivalent sell order for $4 out of whatever your investment account is. Again, if you're comfortable with that risk portfolio. So that's where we're going on a B2C lens. And then conversely, on the B2B side, we have a white label product, which is launching in the same capacity. And so the idea there, or historically, one of the major problems in this industry was that if you wanted to launch a card product on behalf of someone, you had to hold their wealth, which obviously in the asset management world is, is tricky and complicated. And so what we've built is a solution where the wealth and the assets can ultimately sit anywhere, and you, as either the advisor or, or the enterprise, can offer a card solution which integrates a full investment account with a great spending and savings product which doesn't charge fees and, and wraps kind of a delightful product experience. And so we're excited about that. We're excited about the feedback that it's gotten so far, and that's launching in Q4. And while I'd like to say this is an amazing idea that we jointly came up with last week. The truth is, this is an evolution that's happening in a lot of other markets. Like the evolution, the you know, in 20 years, people won't even understand why there was a word checking account and a savings account. And all the things that you're going to be able to do against your high interest savings account could be bill pay, payroll, all of those fundamental things that you would associate with a bank account. There's really no reason they're not just attached to your Well Simple account or your IPC account. And I think that seems so simplistic, but it's really an amazing evolution of, I guess, really the technology that allows, it, allows us to do it. In the case, I know with the Well Simple, the integration is pretty sophisticated, but once you do it once, the use case is there and it should be easy to replicate, I would assume. Yeah, there's a playbook around how funds flow and the APIs and all those kinds of things, and, and we'll continue to handle, to your point, bill pay and e-transfer and all of, like the day-to-day -day requirements of banking, spending insights. Can you explain an API for the crowd? Yeah, of course. So an API is just basically a technical playbook which allows you to integrate simply without actually directly connecting to our code base or vice versa. So it's Can much better. Can you explain simpler? I don't know. OK. <laughs> you try. Company A gets to talk to company B online. And it's seamless. Great. We'll use that. If you think about like Salesforce <laughs> as an example, anyone yeah. use Salesforce in the room? You know, you can add all other apps. It's a sort point. Oh. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm also, be quiet. <laughs> but I think I, so. I, one way to kind of contextualize this: think of banking as the top of funnel thing that people are doing every day. It's where you can 
easily create savings, and so Coho does this through budgeting and cash rewards. Those rewards can, or savings, obviously can be put in an investment account. That investment account can then be managed by someone. And I think that's kind of the, the funnel of not only engagement, but eventually advice once those assets are large enough to be worthy of advice. That is also, I think, one thing I'd like to ask each of you is, there's also this notion of, as the client's needs become more sophisticated, they need more advice. And I think that's for sure true. But you know, where do you see that intersection between the human and technology and maybe Start with you, Jason. Yeah. So, I mean, let's face it, we, we're going to lose a couple battles on this, but we're losing the battles in the areas we should be losing them. We're losing them to all the heavy lifting stuff that we think is our job to do. Paperwork. I've even seen software that's basically going to vastly reduce the amount of time it takes to compose a financial plan. All the things that the stuff that cause us pain and take work and is laborious. Most of that stuff is typically rules-based and is far better handled by computers than we ever could. So those are the battles that are going to be lost, but I'm happy to lose those battles because my time comes back to me and that time gets shifted to all the things that computers cannot beat me on, which is the relationships, which is the advice around everything going on in the client's life, which is taking those outputs from the computers who don't understand a human being fully and making sure that that's gonna work because it could spit out a solution that that person's just never gonna adopt. Holding their hands and making sure they get through that and optimize as per what that output was and explain to them as a simple human being. If you listen to everything that ever gets said by the people who come up here year after year about where we should be focusing our time, it's on the clients and their experience and their relationships. We're going to have the ability to leverage technology to do a much better job more accurately and faster than we ever did before and be able to focus on the thing that the people were actually paying us to help them. Dave, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, I think the big thing is know your value. Be confident in your value. I've known Jason for a couple of years, and there's not one word that you probably would describe him as as confident. I mean, he he lives, breathes financial planning, and that's what he kind of projects out to clients. He's able to feel confident in what he's saying, that he can leverage technology to increase the experience. I think when we talk to advisors who kind of look at our platform and say, you're competing with us, if we're competing you on account onboarding and like tax reporting, uh, like probably not exactly the value prop you want to kind of portray out to markets. So I think technology is definitely here to stay. It's there to help you. Is there going to be cases that clients move between kind of channels? Absolutely. We launched a free trading app. That was a pure competition with ourselves. People can actually go online, look at our portfolio and go buy it for free over here. We fundamentally believe that clients are going to choose the avenue that's best suited for them. That could be full do-it-yourself, it could be light advice, it could be full service advice. It might be in-person versus through web chat, through Zoom, whatever it happens to be. So own and understand exactly what you provide to clients and then leverage the technology around you to make that experience scalable. Because as fees start to compress in the industry, you need to deal with more clients to make the same amount of money. Technology is the only way you're actually going to be able to solve that problem. And if I just may add one point, I actually feel that the future, and I'm seeing a happy in my own practice, is more profitable. We all worry about fee compression. We hear this all the time. But it's been shown in the US, especially too, where with deeper and deeper niches that are being developed by advisors. Top advisors are charging more for their services than ever before. And meanwhile, their overheads are dropping like a rock. I just listened to a podcast with a near $1 billion advisor in San Francisco with 300 clients and zero staff. Exactly. Yeah. For us, just, just yeah. one thing to add there, I see, I see a parallel here in that for us, we're a bit unique in that we're not really like a technology business. We're a services business, we're about human interaction. And I think that while our, our business is very different from that of, of an IPC advisor, there are parallels in that we really want the tech to be just kind of work and to be seamless and to be invisible to a certain extent. So for us, we feel that if we've empowered humans to have effective one-to-one -one communication, so if we allow you know, Dave to quickly open up his app and connect with a, a healthcare practitioner in minutes, seamlessly without having to think about the tech behind it, then we've succeeded. So I think that that's when you talk about the intersection of people but, and technology. That's like our, our I'm, I'm from Quebec, I'm a Torontonian, but our raison d'etre, it's really our reason for being. And so that's sort of one of the guiding lights that really. But I think, I think the other analogy that's very similar to financial services is, you know, your business is really focused on gross margins and how many professionals do you have per customer and getting that ratio right 
And so really dialogues, part of their technology is all about triaging. And when is the right per time to enter a, a full doctor into that discussion? In fact, you guys bought an AI company just to help with that triage. I would think that's kind of a similar analogy to kind of what we're talking to about on the wall side. Yeah, and for us, it's, it's really like the technology is a facilitation play. So if we can use the scary robot hand that Dave talked about, but to actually f make a practitioner's job easier, those are the applications where we really look to use it. And this is the same triage technology in use in the busiest hospital in Montreal. And that's a really, really good point, Adam, because it's for us, we're not just selling technology, we're selling a human service. And if we can use technology to make humans more efficient, which I think is ultimately what you all are trying to do here, then we've succeeded. And you know, there's certain things we, that we kind of have taken for, that we might take for granted, like, you know, we talked about demographics a little bit earlier. We, early on when we first launched our service, it was all done over text and a little bit of video. And you know, over the course of a couple of years, it sounds so obvious, you know, the customers are telling us, we want to be able to call in. We have some older demographics, they want to talk to someone over the phone, mm -hmm. of course. So for us, we need to use technology as a way to make that fit within our workflow of rerouting you to the right professional in the right time in the right province with the right license. And, and that's, uh, that's something that we're really, really interested in while maintaining you know, a high gross margin. I think the cool part for that also is when you think about a financial plan, the thing that derails a financial plan is health-related issues. And so the more you can actually create this ecosystem of technology that's built off of one or one integrated through APIs, you actually start to wrap your hands around clients and have deeper connections than ever before. On the banking side, it's like, how do you disintermediate from your client walking into bank branch over here, where every single day you're putting your clients at risk from being upsold when they walk into a branch? So I think the idea of going forward in the future, and obviously this was the thesis that you and Paul had from five years ago, is how do you create an environment where all of those things are easily being able to, to be purchased with the advisor there as the quarterback of everything to kind of help clients achieve their goals and outcomes? To that point, quoted this uh, last week when I was speaking, there was a Bank of Montreal report that came out over the summer. Over 50% of Canadians trust banks to protect their savings. Only 37% trust them to do what's in their best interest, and that number is declining. So it's a great opportunity for everyone in this room, us included, to figure out how. It's one in three. <laughs> but the huge opportunity. So before we open it up to questions, I just I told the guys before to give some thought. Really think futuristic. Jetsons, I, told, I was told I can't say Jetsons because it dates me too much, but Futurama was the other one. Think very far forward, maybe five years, kind of specifically in your specific verticals, kind of what does the world look like? So I think for those who take a proactive mindset to this, and I just have a very simple process with that. If I feel pain or my staff feels pain, I use Google to find a solution out there, and almost anywhere there's a solution that costs less than 100 bucks a month to do the painful thing faster. At IPC, worry about the big back office stuff, but the little stuff happens. And that's something that's, like I said, compounded. I think my practice currently probably would need almost another full administrator at this point if it wasn't for the things we've implemented. And I look at that as only accelerating, right? And I see the things that the dealership's working on, and I think about the stuff I'm working on, and in five years' time, whether it be other advisors or just more business in the door, I see us being significantly larger with the same amount of overhead and being far more profitable because of it. And not only that, being able to, most importantly, meet the client where they are. So they want to come in and meet because they need that, fine. They are perfectly fine doing virtual calls and me sitting on my couch at home while doing that, great. The reality is, is that we are going to adapt to their needs. And there's a saying in the tech community that Apple's made us all used to things being beautiful and Amazon's made us used to things being instant. That is gonna become a greater and greater demand. The concept that we have to wait three months for an insurance policy to get settled, hopefully that goes away sometime in the next five years. Read life, we're launching it. Yeah, well, I know, I've, I've thought, and he was on the, thing I on the podcast as well. Um, <laughs> until doctors start issuing reports faster, it's never gonna happen. <laughs> but essentially, yeah, five years time, Digital experience, less overhead, fewer bodies, spending less time on the stuff that we're doing and the ability to spend more time on those relationships. And doing so in multi-channel ways and being able to, if we truly develop a true deep value proposition, blast that out to the universe in a much more effective manner. I think from the investment management perspective, models. 
I think we you said it all this morning, but like model portfolios is the way of the future. If you look down in the US, everyone is already doing it. Whether you use a firm's model portfolios or whether you create your own model portfolios, you got to come up with models. It helps you tell your story a lot better when you believe in something. And advisors that have been picking individual securities or funds and have customizations here, here, and here, it's too hard to manage. And it kind of muddies the message that you put out there to market. So I think that's definitely one. I think costs are going to continue to come down as more and more systems and platforms are integrated. It will cost less to service clients. I think this ecosystem thing is real. It creates better personalization for clients. Financial planning integrated into the investment management process helps you tell the story that's not about performance, more about in the context of how the clients want to live their life. So I think it's really, really exciting what's to come over the next kind of four or five years. I also think new revenue streams. You know, I think right now, and a typical advisor sells insurance and investments, and they do some planning. But I think as you get more and more into this, and there's mortgages, there's credit cards, there's all sorts of stuff that you may advise on clients today, but they don't buy it through you. I think that becomes brought together in the future to help both clients and advisors. So I think a couple of things are informing this. One of them is, is open banking, uh, which will hopefully come to Canada in the next few years. But as a result, I think that we are going to see a simplification of our financial lives in terms of a much more curated story. And so the way that we talk about this coho is kind of an end of one, which means everybody's financial life is unique. How do you automate or, or provide as much context around their financial life as possible? I think that we'll continue to see a lot of people play in the card space. We've seen Apple and Amazon and, and all these people uh, begin to launch cards. What we're seeing internally is a lot of banking infrastructure plays top or start up. So I think ultimately who, where, where the relationship sits is, and I, I don't have a, a super strong opinion on this, but I think that remains like one of the questions we're really excited to see play out or, or what is kind of the anchor relationship. Historically, it was mortgages or advisors or front end banking, and those are all merging. And so understanding where the long-term relationship sits is, is something that we're fascinated to see play out. I mean, for our specific business, there's a lot of interesting technology around wearables and things like that. But within the context of today's discussion, I think that the theme that we've seen already kind of emerge in the enterprise that will be kind of seen more widely outside of this context is something that we've already talked about today, which is kind of simplifying the access for the user. So let's imagine someone were a dialogue client, a coho client, an IPC client, a Wealthsimple client. Like, do they need to manage four logins? Do they need to manage four unique relationships with four unique vendors? And, and anything that we as you know, financial services professionals or uh, members of the Portage ecosystem can do to bring that together and simplify the experience for the end user is going to be something that I think is going to see a lot of attention in the coming years. Dave, did you have something you wanted to interject? I was just going to say to Dan's point, I think like the financial advisor, when he talks about is it going to be the mortgage brokers, the insurance rep that's going to be able to kind of bring that all together, you already have a leg up. You're already doing the plan. You already know all this stuff. It's a matter of now kind of bringing it together and kind of wrapping it with a bow. So I think it's really exciting. Nothing to be scared of. Yeah, just one thing to add. I mean, we the common refrain I hear among so many advisors is competition from the bank because people feel like the bank is, they're still gonna need the bank at some point. And I gotta tell you, the thing that makes me incredibly optimistic about what I call a, very, a game of very obvious chess that Portage is playing by knocking off every function of a bank is that integration of all that gives us potentially the level playing field of eliminating them from the equation and being able to essentially become the concierge for that client's life in so many ways. Maybe one more, and I think you're a perfect example of this, is, and we've seen this play out in Asia as well, but the, the lines between what is a financial company and what is not a financial company are continuing to blur. And for example, at Coho, we have a spin-out subscription service which monitors your price receipts to make sure that you got the best price, because all these vendors have price matching services, but it's very difficult to execute on them. So that transcends into not just making the best price, but ultimately into health, into a number of non-financial entities or non-financial directions. So I think that will be continue to get broader as well. Great. Well, that's all the formal questions I had prepared. So we're going to go to the audience. I think, have, do we have instructions of how this all goes down? This guy waving his hand. That's Good old-fashioned way. I was going to say okay. the non-technological oh, questions right we'll there. We'll take okay. that one while I <laughs> think, figure out the technology. Non-tech question. Do we have a microphone right in the middle? Here comes microphones coming down. Uh, the tech panel doesn't have a tech solution for asking the questions. This is fantastic. <laughs> it's a good thing I exercise. I keep my arm elevated that long. <laughs> 300 clients, a billion of assets, no assistant. 
how close is IPC to that? And do we have the resources right now? Or how long is it going to take us to get there? So I'm, I'm going to put a big asterisk on that and say the guy lives in Silicon Valley. OK, so that helps. But basically, it was very simple. And if you want to listen to it, it's a Michael Kitz's podcast. And it was like one of the last four that he published. Anyway, so the point is, is that his model was to outsource portfolio management entirely to what is known as a TAMP in the US. Translation, private wealth. Right? The difference, I will say, and you guys are listening, is that that organization will also take care of all the paperwork and administration, which if you digitize all that, <laughs> hint, <laughs> and basically leaving that advisor to solely focus on client relationships and financial planning. That was <laughs> it. And he was able to pick the, you know, he's dealing with DFA, and he's able to create about two dozen model portfolios for the, this gentleman's comment. And he's deployed that across all 300 households. Great. How, how, sorry, follow-up question. How close are we to be, um, being able to offer digitized banking services to our clients? Our clients do not need to have a relationship with the big five or six. <laughs> uh, this is also up uh, on the iPad as well. So I don't want to step in for Reggie and Chris and, and their plans, but I would say that the partnership between Wealthsimple and Coho is a pretty big step. The architecture that's being done there is very sophisticated. It's never been done in Canada. And we expect to launch that in Q1-ish? Q4. Q4. So that really lays the foundation for other partnerships. And I think it's fair to say that many of those discussions are happening. Anything else, Daniel? Is that if you want to learn more, you can email me at daniel at coho.ca. I'm happy to provide you specific info. <laughs> I told you, it works every time. Right? <laughs> the next question, um, oh, we're getting lots of questions. Uh -huh. Exciting. Maybe, Jason, for you, John Klotz was asking, what kind of practices will thrive in the next three to five years? What do they look like? It sounds like sure. higher net worth is what you just alluded to. Well, but. I think not just higher net worth. I mean, the reality is, is that a lot of this is going to be cost cutting, which is going to lower overhead, which is going to enable the servicing of clients in not the multiple hundreds of thousands, but maybe at 100,000, right? So I think it's market expanding at the same time. So what kind of practices survive? Those who see their value as more than the heavy lifting or the pointing to the fund. That's the reality. Because if you want to be pointed to an investment, not just Dave's company, but several other robo-advisors will, with a questionnaire, point you to investment and get you invested really quick. That's not where our value is. You know, when you start looking at what is really, what really, every academic study shows, it's the focusing on the planning side and the challenges in the planning side, like decumulation planning, everything else. So to me, the, the planning-centric model that is very high touch are the thriving practices. The I am a, sorry, mutual fund salesperson and I just want to sell stuff, that's going to be challenged because there's a lot of competition in that space. So you're clearly being effective because one of the other questions is, do you do practice management <laughs> consulting? <laughs> I was you know, that business activity, yeah, so that's I was going to be thrilled with Yeah, that. I was going to say, Matthew's shaking his head right now. I'll have a conversation. <laughs> my URL is firstname.lastname at woodget.com. <laughs> my URL, my email address, yeah. There's a good question uh, for you, Zach, in terms of, can you talk a little bit about the dialogue platform and when someone triages to an actual doctor and needs to see someone, and I like, how does that transition work? Yeah, so good question. With respect to the primary care visits that we tend to see on the platform, whether it's dialogue or anything done virtually, you can trip typically handle about seven out of 10 things that come on. So let's say, uh, God forbid you break your arm, you should probably go to the ER and see someone in person. Typically the way that it works is if you go on the platform, you're able to complete a few specific questions automatically, which would then route you to the right resource, whether it be a nurse, a nurse practitioner or a physician. Following that, you would be doing a video, most of the time a video consultation with a practitioner who would be able to do, uh, reach a few potential outcomes. One could be a prescription, one could be a referral for uh, you know, a specialist like a dermatologist or what have you. One could be a referral for a mental health professional. One could be a requisition for a lab test. So it's most of the time, the consults that are being done on the platform are, are done completely virtually. For those cases where we can't help the patient, so let's imagine you go on the platform and you're saying, you know, I need a, I'm, I'm going on a vacation tomorrow, I need a travel clinic. We're actually able to kind of provide a concierge service that we have built into our platform. So these are 
non-medical practitioners who can take you by the hand and say, okay, there's a travel clinic you know, this close to your office, there's one, they're taking patients at this particular time, there's one this close to your home. And that's something that we've invested a lot in is this notion of care coordination because, I mean, I'm a perfect example. I'm an Anglophone, Torontonian living in Quebec. I think accessing, for example, like the provincial health resources can be a challenge sometimes. You'll go on the, uh, the website, you'll click the English page and the link is broken. So I have the ability to go on the platform and, and get answers to questions that I might have like on the fly and, and from a reliable source very, very quickly. So again, you all that are members of the IPC family have access to this benefit through Great West. I did write it down in preparation for this because I know I'll get the question. Your plan number, ready? Got you. 167. <laughs> 041. So download the app from the app store or go to <laughs> app.dialog.co, plan number 167041, and then enter in your plan member as the ID from your Great West Life card, and then you're off to the races. Correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe you already said it, uh, and I was reading questions, but my favorite part is getting my prescriptions delivered. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we, we have the ability, it's a great, great point, we have the ability to have the prescription delivered 24 uh, 7. With, sorry, within 24 hours free of charge or sent to your local pharmacy. So let's imagine it's something you need, you know, within 15 minutes or an hour, you can have that delivered to the Shoppers Drug Mart or the Pharma Pre or wherever. Otherwise, let's say you're taking a maintenance drug or something that is non-urgent, you can actually have that delivered to your home or office, discrete packaging within 24 hours free of charge. Great. There are a lot of questions around, well, simple and the new arrangement. I think you and maybe Reggie can do a session outside and sure. the coffee break. And yeah, start. just come over, over to the booth and we'll answer all those questions then. They're fairly specific. One question, which is, I think, a good one, a bit of fun, is are any of these companies profitable without the Demerase? <laughs> oh, man. Which, and and Fileski. <laughs> so, so it's an interesting question. So I think importantly, anytime we invest in a company, and, and to be clear, Actually, the Demerays don't have any capital personally or the family directly in our fund. Our first fund was three investors, Power Financial, IGM, and Great West. We're just closing our second fund, which we're going to have about 25 LPs, only three of which are the Power and, and, and related affiliates, and they'll be a minority of the capital. But when we look at any investment in fintech, generally, they're not going to make money for a first period of time. But we wanna see kind of what pain point are they solving? What traction are they seeing? What engagement with their customers do they have? Is it growing? Why? And can they replicate it? And we really focus on something we talk about all the time with all three of these guys are unit economics. So how much does it cost to acquire a customer? What's the payback? of acquiring that customer and how's that evolving over time. And if those unit economics that we get focused on start working, we're confident that we're gonna attract other capital to be investors alongside us. So in the case of Well Simple, Alliance came in the last round, which was super important. They invested 50 million. Daniel, you've got a bunch of different private investors. You were actually seeded by a group out of Vancouver, Stanley Park Ventures, and then Greyhound in the UK as an investor? So we've got VCs from Europe, four or five VC groups from Canada or Canada, and then we've also had a bank invest in us as well in a minority position. And then Dialog had, well, has many international investors, but your most recent round was just led by La Casse, which is super exciting. Yeah, so Caisse de Depot uh, Placement, which was the Quebec Pension Fund, put in uh, alongside some of our uh, other investors uh, our Series B round of 40 million. And we're actually also funded by the, one of the largest VCs in Europe. And we've recently launched a few projects uh, overseas. So we're actually, our technology and the framework of our services in use in the largest hospital network in Germany. So if you go into a, one of their hospitals, you'll actually be triaged on an iPad within a couple of minutes. And that'll allow you to be seen by the right resource very, very quickly. And this is the same principle, but just done in a different context. And it's not unimaginable to see similar kind of use cases for us here, uh, here at home. So long way to answer, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there's but more people the behind yeah, right now. The, the, These great companies can stand on their own two feet, and I think they've demonstrated they can do it. We obviously are trying to have a leadership position and, and a large ownership in some of these companies, particular ones that are in our home markets. But I think all of these guys have been really successful at raising other capital. So I see we're, we're out of time. I apologize. I know there's 
a lot more questions here. I'm happy to speak to you individually. I'll be on the boat tonight. Look forward to that. But thank you to our panelists, and uh, thanks for having us. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed that panel discussion on FinTech and Future Advice. Please take the time to visit the other panel members' companies and take a look at the good work that they're doing out there. And as always, I am Jason Pereira, and this has been FinTech Impact. If you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.ca.